I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Afternoon, Niall. It's always yeah. a disappointment when Nicola's not here. Yeah, I can't believe it's not Nicola, as somebody <laughs> said. But um, so even though you're having a bad week having to deal with me, um, you're not having as bad a week as Mary Cash, who this week was uh, before the courts twice, um, once on charges of money laundering and one in a, a case involving cab. I mean, it's been, uh, it, it, the details were quite uh, spectacular, I think, in the cab case, Eamon. Yeah, I think she kind of failed the first rule of of PR in trying to, uh, as you did point out to me earlier, yeah, um, in trying to explain away her money, don't use something that's even more interesting. So we'll come to that, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, Mary Cash, um, Nia Kylie, um, uh, she, she would have, she'd be, have her roots in, in Cork, but living in Port Leash. Um, and they basically, the cab, cab went after her. It was a full hearing um, on when, on Wednesday and it was pretty much, it was a, a bungalow that herself and her husband have, or they live in, in, in Port Lee. She's the, she's the, the sole owner. Like he, he wasn't actually part of the case. Uh, but as, as part of, of the case against her, it was, you know, there were sworn affidavits from criminal asset bureau officers to say that her husband and her brother are both members of an organized crime gang who are involved in robberies, burglaries all over the country. And that they allege then as well that sometimes she was involved in driving them to where they were going to commit crimes or else procur- procuring cars for them uh, for them to use in in the in in, in this uh, endeavor. So I mean, did the amount like the money going through like over? I think it's over a ten year period they track going through the the bank accounts. I mean, it's quite spectacular, really. Like, I mean, so I mean, this is obviously there, there was a cab case um, on on Wednesday, and. Cab are seeking to first they were seeking to seize some money that was in bank accounts and then the there's also there there's a, you know a legal battle going on around house the house and the assets, um, but obviously the day before um, Mary Cash had come to court in in Waterford and pled guilty to money laundering charges as well. Yeah, that that turned up um, like on, on Tuesday it was actually Kilkenny Circuit Kilkenny, Criminal sorry, Court. Yeah. yeah, and and she had. I think she was initially charged with eight counts of money laundering and she pleaded guilty to three of them. So that was accepted and she, she's due for sentencing soon enough. Uh, and and that, that involved, that's actually how Cab got onto the whole case that she was initially arrested in, in 2018. Um, uh, she was in an Argos store and a, a, a child who was in her charge um, was suspected by staff of trying to take something. And as a result, the guardie were called and she was arrested. Now she doesn't, she didn't necessarily have any direct connections with Kilkenny, but when I suppose they started looking at her more closely. The two uh, Kilkenny-based guards discovered then that she had, uh, well, first of all, she had something like a thousand euro worth of Qatari Rial on her, which is, I suppose, a bit of a question mark straight away. But then they also what found... Is, can we take, what is Qatari Rial? That's, that's... I, it's, I suppose it's the currency from right. Qatar. Um, yeah. And it, it was 4,000 4, or something of them worth about a thousand euro, uh, apparently, according according to the XE.com. Uh, so... They found then that she she had a lockup uh, in Kilkenny City where she didn't live. You know, at that stage she was given her address as still as in Cork. Um, and so they started they started going through, uh, and what they found then in that was another nine and a half thousand in sterling and in euros hidden in various items in this little. It was you know it was a commercial locker storage area, and of course then they went they went to do a little bit more searching, and they found that she was actually living in in a bungalow in Port Leash, and when they raided that house a month later. They found a lot more stuff, um, including you know there was sums of seven hundred uh, euro and nine hundred sterling in 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 a handbag in in the uh, front bedroom, and then there was a secret compartment over the fireplace in the bedroom in the same bedroom, and there was six thousand uh, pounds sterling found in that in two socks, and of course they, they could, they, you know as they do they go looking then for the high value items, and you know I. I like they mean nothing to me, but yeah. some people might be better better suited to, to figuring out what they are. But there was, I suppose, the most expensive watch was the gold Cartier Santos Galbe watch worth two thousand euro. There was a Chanel and Quartz women's watch worth about nine hundred euro, and there's two diamond bracelets which between them were worth over four thousand two hundred. Um, and then I think there was something like five different five different um, designer handbags were taken as well from uh, by the guards, and. 
there was a follow up then search um, a little bit later, and on that occasion, then they found a phone that which she had, and on that she had some, uh, I suppose, photographs that showed off her fairly lavish lifestyle, and this included a picture of herself and her husband waving some money in Harrods in London, doing a bit of shopping, which there I think. And the judge who, commented it wasn't the wisest thing to do. No, who hasn't done it? Um, so like it's, you know, they are kind of mount watering amounts of money to be just floating around. I mean, it's not, it doesn't like the, the court also heard how the house was actually bought. It's in uh, Port Leach and Harper's Lane and it was bought uh, for cash, which is a really, I mean, this is, I think it was in 2018, was it? It was yeah, actually yeah. bought for cash, which is which is, is not a sophisticated kind of way to, to make a purchase, you would have thought. No, I, I, I and no, it isn't a sophisticated way to do it, but I, I think that Mary Cash would have thought that they had their tracks sufficiently covered at this stage. And the story was, I mean, they did they weren't she wasn't particularly cooperative with the guards, but in in, in one of her replying affidavits uh, in the case then she 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 suggested that during a, a year long period, I think it was twenty 2014 to 2015, herself and her husband went to Australia and were working there. And, and she he was doing tarmacking and, and gravel work and power washing. And then she was working both as a, a childminder, a cleaner, and also as an escort. So this was kind of casually thrown out, which, of course, being the Sunday World journalist that I am, sort of immediately, I thought, did I hear that right? And well, you'd be happy to know, Eamon, that the Irish Times also picked up on it uh, and included it in their copies. So. Well, I, I did consult with my sure. media colleagues there. I said, did I hear that right? And it was, yes, you did. And you see, like, I suppose these things appear in court and they, they're they always going to be picked out for, for a headline, you know, um, because... Obviously, uh, something like that is really kind of noteworthy. Um, like now, having been in Australia myself, like in order to get a lot of money, you're not going to make it being a childminder or a cleaner. Like to amass that kind of enough money to buy a house or or even to, to bring home amount. Like you're not going to get it from those sort of mm. things. Um, well, they, well, they did suggest that. While they were there, they stayed with friends and family and they had almost no outgoings and that this trip was all about trying to save up enough for a, for a family home. But, you know, of course, the Criminal Assets Bureau with their own forensic accountants, you know, they couldn't find any, any anything at all to even show uh, how they paid for the flights to Australia. There was nothing to show of any, any you, know, con, you know, serious transfers. I think there was one transfer for $9,000, uh, um, but that was it. Um, you know, the only bank account that existed was the one in her name. And, you know, and over this entire period, I think, oh, I think they, they looked at nearly, nearly a 16, 17 year period. She would have got about 139,000 euro in welfare payments while her husband had never been on social welfare and had absolutely no income whatsoever, according to social welfare or revenue. So, I mean, the idea that, that they were able to, you know, come up with a hundred grand that somehow this was money, you know, that they had earned three years earlier in, in Australia, you know, wasn't sticking. And, and Cab have suggested then that, you know, as they put it, the money was already dissipated, as was, I think, f money from, I think, three different um, um, uh, motor accidents insurance claims that she would have made and one her husband would have made, that that money was well gone by the time they, they bought the house. And so their argument was that, you know, this is from the proceeds of crime. And even after her bank account had been frozen, when the guards went back, they found, you know, more renovations had been done. They spoke to a builder who said he was paid in cash to put in. He didn't buy the materials. But again, you know, it was thousands of euro worth of uh, a new bathroom and, and wooden flooring, a, a front door and this kind of stuff. So, you know, like, I mean, she, she, I mean, in fairness, she denies the, she denies the, the cab allegations. She's claiming that she traded in horses and cars and jewelry and that she dealt with individuals and at markets and that, you know, this is, she admitted that, yeah, look, this is off the grid. She wasn't paying tax. But again, there's no evidence of, you know, ever a vet ever having been paid of, of someone ever buying, you know, a horse feed on, on her, you know, on her behalf. Uh, you know, there was nothing like that to show uh, any kind of trail where she was involved in this kind of trading. So, you know, it's it's going to be up to Judge Alex Owens to finally decide whether or not the, the, the house and the designer goods and the Volkswagen Golf are the, the proceeds of crime or not. Because that's obviously in dispute, like of, to some of the cash that was seized, it's not in dispute. That's the uh, freezing order has been made on on that. I mean, you know, obviously the the cab case is really clear that, that this is, uh, she was living a very lavish lifestyle and this is, mainly as a result of the proceeds of crime, either directly or indirectly, and they're namely uh, as a result of burglaries, which she is denying, obviously. But, you know, it just showed that that cab are, you know, we we tend to cover the drug dealers 
or the, the gangland criminals, I suppose, um, and the, some of the mouth-watering amounts of money that can be made in the drugs trade. But here, a cab making a case that there's huge money to be made in 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 by burglary gangs as well across the country, which I think is maybe surprising. But obviously, it's something that you've covered again and again. That this, like we possibly, some people think this is kind of maybe a, a sort of a petty criminal trade, but the burglary trade can be hugely lucrative. Yeah, like we know um, from our own coverage, not just me, but from, you know, all of us in the Sunday world have done various stories about the professional burglary gangs. A lot of them, you know, would have been connected on both sides of his family to Fat Andy Connors. Uh, you know, and these these are guys who go out, you know, groups of three or four in, you know, a, a couple of different cars. They carry out ram raids. Um, they'll do five jobs in a single night. I, you know, 20 years ago, they were they were known as the Subaru gang because their their choice of car was the, I think, the Subaru Impreza, which was basically faster than anything the guards had at the time. And the, the Garda helicopter unit wasn't up and running at that stage or wasn't up and flying. Um, and, you know, and, and these guys have just finessed their their skill level. Like, you know, they, they, they can... They know where they're going. They're getting a tip off uh, who to chase. Uh, we, we saw, like, in fact, one of uh, Fat Andy's sons was recently part of a, a gang who were in Scotland and in, in Northumberland in the UK. And <clears throat> the police there had intelligence that they were actually using trackers on to the, they were putting them onto the cars of, of uh, ch- basically Chinese restaurant owners because they figured that, you know, they, they had this idea that these these Chinese restaurant owners were, were, you know, were, were hoarding their cash, weren't, weren't Probably are more the cash, and, cash pays. And, yeah, well, whether it's true or not, this is their idea. And they had this sophistication then to like, let's watch, see who the boss is. When he arrives, we'll put a tracker on his car, find out where he lives, and wait till he goes back to work and break into the house and take the safe. So, I mean, in one sense, it was, you know, it's a, it's a clever thing. And I mean, and one of those guys now we know recently was caught in, in Australia. Where he that, was facing that is charges. another feature, isn't it, of, of these, these gangs moving around, not just through Ireland, but through through the UK, into Europe, and then of course even into the States and into Australia, that they they just do use the same modus operandi around all these countries. Yeah, and and you know they're they're plugged into that kind of underworld. Like they'll know somebody who'll know somebody who'll be able to get them a new passport. They'll know somebody who will get them on the right flight, and you know where to get the bus to get in through, to the States through Canada, or how to get through you know, the easiest way of getting back into Australia, you know, whether it's using your brother's passport or whether you're just flying on a, a, a you know, a, a genuine passport that was, you know, applied for with bogus information. And we know that there, there's court cases coming up in relation to that um, at, at some point in the future here in Ireland. But it, like, I mean, we've even seen there was there was a group of people who are suspected of, of being involved in, in a similar type of crime, uh, you know, who were caught by the uh, homeland security coming from a boat from Cuba. Now these weren't refugees in a in a in a you know in a rickety boat. They you know they'd hired an, o- an ocean going s- sort of pleasure fishing boat yep. to 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 bring them in. Now we haven't found out yet who they are. No. So it'd be interesting to keep an eye out for that one when it arrives. And of course, like it's you know the burglaries that have gone on across rural Ireland really have had a very deep impact on some of the people who are targeted because another obviously one of the main targets for these gangs tends to be jewellery. I remember somebody telling me um, um, how quickly they can get in and out of a house. They go in the fr- whatever front door, back door, and they can be done and dusted within the space of two to three minutes. I mean, it's it's quite phenomenal. Like, Yeah, I know. We've seen them at work. Well, I haven't personally seen them at work, but I've seen their handiwork shortly afterwards, you know, where, I mean, they'll, it, you know, even if you have an alarm, if you have cameras, you know, outside static lights, all the stuff you're advised to have. I mean, they, they'll just jemmy open a window, um, you know, it can be a double glazing, double locked, but they'll break it open, go through. They'll smash the internal screamer, as it's called, to turn off the alarm so they can shout to each other. Uh, you know, they'll even, I've, I know of a case <clears throat> close to where I live where they just, they got out a, a bathroom window and, and smashed the alarm box that was ringing just to turn it off. And then spent their, you know, were pretty cool and calm about rummaging through, looking for any valuables. So Mary Kylie, um, or Mary Cash, as she's she's Mary known, Cash Kylie, yeah. yeah. Um, she was in court. I mean, a lot of these cab cases, people aren't necessarily there all the time. Um, she's obviously denying the 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 basic charge of of cab. Well, how did she speak coming out, or was she? Uh, there was at one point she, I think she, 
there's at different stages, like she, she uh, popped up from where she was sitting to say something to one of her legal team. But, um, and then just towards the end, uh, she stood up and she said something like, I wasn't involved in that when they were, uh, when they were talking about uh, some criminal activity that her husband had been accused of. Uh, I, I briefly approached them afterwards as they were coming out. And I think at the moment they realized it was a journalist, they just, they, they ignored me and, and they put on the the face masks, you know, are been a, so, well, so well known from our, our COVID days. Yeah, it's been, yeah, people are still wearing them coming out of court for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah it's a nice, nice, nice idea, really, you know. It is. Um, so, so she's had a tough week in a sense, like, you know, so that's, she's two days in court this week. I think she's going to have a third this week as well when she gets sentenced. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the, the obviously the escort bit is picked up in all the papers and, and everywhere. And of course, she's well done up and looking glamorous coming out. Um, but that's, that's, that was one cab case, but there was a series of 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 heavyweight uh, names who were before the, the the cab list as well this week. Um, one of them being James Mago Gately in in uh, Mago Gately, obviously a Hutch associate. Um, there's been a long running battle uh, between Cab to try and seize his home in Kulak. Um, Mago Gately is one of the somebody who was the number one or one of the number one targets for the Kinahan cartel over a period of years survived, uh, you narrowly survived a shooting and a other attempts. Um, now he's, uh, unlike say some of the other people associated with that feud have come before the courts have not really put up a resistance against Cab. He is putting up a, at least a partial resistance and has been, he was granted free legal aid to, it's it's a complicated case, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, and they are hard to follow. And in, and in James Mago's case, the actual affidavits, like the actual, what the actual case is against him, we don't know yet. Now, yeah. we presume they're going to say, well, he's part of a major criminal organization because we, we know that separately anyway. Yeah. Um, but like, just, 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 just before we get into Mago, like the kind of the... the the, the cab list is very much, it's an ongoing kind of housekeeping exercise where the criminal assets bureau come back and say, we've done this and we've done that. And now we're seeking an order for something else. And then if there's a defense, they'll say, well, look, we haven't had a chance to read this and we haven't had a chance to file an affidavit and, you know, and reply and we're looking for more time. So this is constantly going on. Now, in, 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 in the, the case against Mago Gately and his partner, Charlene Lamb, it, most of it centers on their, their house in Kulak, which they bought for something like 130000 And Carver's saying that they spent 444000 doing it up, you know, which like huge, mul multiples yeah, of, yeah. of what it was actually worth. And their, their basic argument is saying, saying well, you know, he, he, did, he did the work himself and he got the materials a lot cheaper. Yeah. So th the argument now uh, this week was that um, they, need, they should be allowed to have a quantity surveyor and a forensic accountant to, to go through all of this um, because the cab have used a forensic accountant and uh, a quantity surveyor to make their case, so they should be allowed to appoint their own. Now, this this is this is going on. I mean, the, the they were allowed free legal aid last November, I think it was, or certainly last year, or twenty twenty one, I think actually when yeah. when it uh, could even be. Uh, and and they're saying, look, well, we can't find anyone to do it. And they got two quotes: a quantity surveyor and a in, in the UK who was suggesting the equivalent of the sterling equivalent of about 10 grand was going to take him whatever it was he worked out how many hours to read all the stuff to interview the people to fly over to, to Kulak and measure it and then similarly with the forensic accountant he was suggesting that it was going to cost him 24,000 euro well, I think it was it was said was that it was 175 hours of work going to be 24 grand which is more than Nicola pays you for your crime world hours. Yes, it's, one it's, it's, it's quite a lot. I think uh, uh, Joe Jones actually described it. He said he was gobsmacked when he first read it and said it was an outrageous fee. Uh, and I suppose it, as in, in his own style, like he mentioned, you know, there's a, the, I think one of, one of the, one of the professionals who had made this quote said like, well, to read the file of 1152 pages is going to take whatever amount of hours it was. And Joe Jones was able to work out, well, that's 11, 11 pages an hour. He says, well, I read it in eight hours. <laughs> yeah, he, so he, he made a big cut. Um, he more or less said then, well, you can, you can, have, you can have both, but he capped it at 14,000 plus fat for the two of them. And, and, and kind of said, look, hurry up and get on with this. He's good, like, isn't he, Joe Jones, in terms of quotes he gives, he, he gives it like... Yes, I, 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 he, he is. I, I, yeah, I, he know? is. I'm not sure that he, he particularly likes his reporting them, but he, I suppose he can't help himself with the, the few no, clips. I mean, no, even... Even when he, it, I think with Mary Cash this week, when it was mentioned that on a second raid, they found more watches. He, his, his remark was, well, you can't have enough watches, can you? So. Which, is, which is true. Um, <laughs> now, it's funny, like, you know, you hear all these cab, you hear those sort of fees and you realise at the end of it all, there are, <laughs> the, the clear winners are going to be 
the lawyers. The lawyers, isn't yes, it? The lawyers, the professionals, as they say, you know, about, uh, you know, if you get divorced, yeah. it's divided up, you know, <laughs> three ways, <laughs> like between you, your partner and the lawyers. Um, and obviously then the, the Ross Browning um, cab case kind of came to to an end really this week. Um, the guards ultimately released pictures um, of the house that they seized in Garristown. We I spoke to Nicola about it during the week. Um you know that was that that also I suppose shows the 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 determination of them to pursue these these cases and um like it is a big win I think if you've been through that that case at almost every stage really haven't you you've yeah I mean so uh, I think the figure that we we came up with trying to work it all out all, all the various property is one point four million and I suppose in the scale of it when you look at what the Kinnan cartel are supposedly worth it's 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 a tiny drop. But I suppose it sends out the message that you're not going to enjoy the fruits of your underworld success here in Ireland. So you're going to have to go somewhere else and you can't drip feed, you know, luxury cars and jewellery and cash to, you know, your friends and family who do you favours like, you know, book your flights to Las Vegas or, you know, and, and this is all these minute detail that came up during the case. Uh, I, you know, like I remember years ago talking to somebody involved in a, in a, a Crumlin drug gang. And, and I was saying, what do you do with all the money you're making? Yeah. And he was saying, well, anytime there's a bit of trouble, you've got to, you know, you've got to take about 28 members of your family on holidays. Yeah. And they're expecting to be, you know, to get free beer and food when they're out in Alicante or wherever it was at the time. So when you're, uh, when you're, you know, the, the number one man uh, for the Kinnan cartel in Ireland, presumably you have a few overheads. Yeah. And you see, I suppose, in reality that, that we are getting to the point where it's becoming almost impossible for for criminals to buy property in Ireland, I think. I mean, we've seen these cab cases, um, you know, the various ways that people have used to describe or to disguise the wealth. And and Ross Browning had a few of them, as you said, uh, putting it in people's names, having other sources of income like, uh, like um, uh, you know, claims and stuff like that. But it really doesn't seem to be washing over in, in, when it comes to the, the crunch. Yeah, I'm... I mean, look, I mean, one time it was enough, you know, if a small time criminal had two grand in his pocket, it was enough to say I wanted at the races, yeah. and, you know, and the onus of proof was on the guards of the authorities. But that was the whole thing about the Proceeds of Crime Act. It switched it. And now all of a sudden, if you've two grand in your pocket and they know you're a criminal and you haven't worked a day in your life, you have to explain where that two grand comes from. I mean, if you think back to the heyday of, of you know, Larry Dunn buying a big house, you know, with cash or, or John Gilligan betting on the horses and relying on on those betting slips to to justify his income like it's really you know at this point I'm sure there's other ways and people will come up, come up with other ways but it's really getting to the point that it's very very hard to to buy homes and to renovate those homes which is something that I think um people really believe for a long time in in the criminal underworld that you could inherit maybe a house or have a modest house in, in in an ordinary estate and then just spend whatever you want to tune it up. I think that's really something Cab have cracked down on again and again now. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, and, and all the bling and all the, you know, even 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 the lifestyle, like, you know, if, if somebody's taking expensive cruises, that's used then in evidence to say, look, they also spent whatever it was, 20,000 euro on a, a one week holiday, or as in one of the Waldron's cases, five grand on a christening in, in, in the middle of, you know, a cab case where they're looking for free legal aid. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they, they look at all this and, and if they can't get the money, they'll use it in evidence. Like, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll bring this forward to the judge to say, look, this person seems to have access to, uh, you know, large sums of money with no, no explanation of the origin of that cash. So, I'd love, I'd love to find out what they do with all the handbags. There must have been, I mean, I know they say there's record drug seizures this year, but there must be record numbers of handbags there's seized. Sold, there's the guard auction. Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all this stuff is sold off, all the Rolexes. And, is there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause the, a, of course, the Rolexes hold value, but I'm not sure about the handbags. I know, I think they do, actually. Do they? Yeah, yeah, I'm told. <laughs> 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 no, well, you actually saw that in, in, in last month with the, again, it was another Kinahan linked money laundering operation. And there's a group of people from China who, who are using, I think it's the Dehai De system. Yep. Sorry, where, you know, if like a surrogate shopper works for, uh, you know, working for someone in China and they send stuff back. And, you know, sometimes it's over serious things like, you know, baby formula that's safe and all the rest. But it's also to get hold of goods that might be restricted there or hard to get. Um, and so you had people going into Brown Thomas buying designer goods, you know, like, you know, Louis Vuitton bags, which presumably are several thousand euro, you know, yeah. especially the weekend, the large bags, you know, the brown, the brown, I do, the red, I the do, red trim. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, so, I mean, you know, just like handbags and Rolexes, you know, anything that holds value, it's a, yeah. it's a token. You know, you, you see it in, in other places where horses are used, like, you know, yeah. as a financial marker. And again, you, you know, you can travel somewhere and you've got a 20 grand watch. Uh, you know, there's going to be a pawnbroker. Somebody somewhere is going to give you 12 grand for it. You know, you're going to take a big hit in it. But it means you can dive out the, the, the top window of your house and make a run for it. And you've got, you know, the guts of 20 yeah. grand on your on your person. So, well, look, we'll have to do your top 10 handbags of the year, <laughs> Eamon, uh, at another date, maybe. I look forward to it. I'll, I'll, I'll do a bit of study. Thanks very much, Eamon. It's always a pleasure, Niall.